it. Um, Sharon's going to be talking about the greatest challenge of today's employers, recruiting and retaining <laughs> quality employees. Um, so how CSR is enabling employers to keep, engage and excite their greatest resource. And she's going to be create, uh, showing us case studies from around the world. Now, I don't know how, <clears throat> how you feel about case studies, but I love them. I mean, they really um, give life and vitality to any presentation. So that should be terrific. Now, while Sharon's um, setting things up there, I'll just tell you a little bit um, about how accomplished she is. Managing Director of Carlton CSR, and a visiting lecturer at the Cranfield School of Management in the UK, of course. Um, since 2000, Sharon has been a management consultant in the area of cultural change, teaching business how to combine fundamental best practice and corporate responsibility as a facet of global sustainability. She designs groundbreaking corporate responsibility leadership programs for senior executives and boards, which sounds just fabulous, I'd love to be at one of those, uh, to enable innovative leadership of profitable and responsible business, whilst contributing positively to the environment and society. And these pioneering programs have led, have, are held in the French Alps, I'm even keener to be there, and the Tasmanian wilderness. Uh, Australian clients include um, companies like Abbey National, um, IAG, ABC, Orange Telecom, etc. So an impressive client list, and I'm sure we're in for a very entertaining and uh, useful session. Thank you, Wendy. <coughs> well, the first thing to tell you is I'm losing my voice. <laughs> I've been talking non-stop for four days, so excuse me, I'm croaky, which is very unlike me. Um, I have got a few slides to show you, but we're a small group, which is great. I have a few slides. I'm a little bit PowerPointed out myself. I've got through 300 so far in the last few days. I've just got a few to set the scene and some case studies around some research that's been done in Great Britain just recently. In fact, it launched this project anyway at the end of October. What I would like, with your permission, is to have a discussion about how to embed HR practices in the heart of CSR. Um, because I'm my feeling, and you can contradict me, is that in the UK we've started to have some quite interesting forums around this, and some research, and there are groups of uh, uh, people getting together to actually discuss and share how to embed HR practices. When I come here to Australia, I find it quite difficult to find similar groups and HR practitioners who actually know how to get their name even noticed on the CSR agenda. Quite frequently, it lives in either health and safety or marketing and PR. And the HR departments, I think, are finding it quite difficult to say, yes, we should be part of this revolution. So with your permission, can we do that around more of a workshoppy, flip charty type more creative and innovative. Would that be all right? <laughs> um, the other thing is, um, I brought for you guys, and some of you were in the, the discussion yesterday about measurement of Mission Australia. We may well, hi Naomi, we may well end up talking about some of the way that we've involved HR at Mission Australia. There's an article here, like, like, article here I wrote about the Corporate Responsibility Index and the fact that an index and benchmark is only a benchmark. It's what you actually do in the organisation that matters. Um, and again, HR is absolutely essential for that, so you have yourself to those. I also um, we were referring to an article I wrote for Charles Institute of Personal Development about HR that's central to CSR, some steps and how to. Again, if you want copies, I have printed loads off, because you don't waste paper, do we? Um, but if you want a copy, I can happily email that to you, um, and also one that I wrote for the, um, Charles, uh, for the Chamber of Commerce in New South Wales, again, about actually taking the facets of CSR to the heart of the business, not just reporting on it, not just talking about it, but actually taking it to the heart. And at the end of the day, if it's not about people, what on earth is this all about? How can HR have been quite marginalised in this whole revolution? I don't, don't know how that's happened, but I think if we can start talking about maybe some initiatives around Australia to try and stimulate that change effectively. So that's what I've got in my mind. <laughs> um, and if we can get it informal, that will suit me today. It's like my last day, I'm getting into kind of wind-up mode at the moment. So is that about that already? <laughs> okay, I'm going to be referring to... Actually, can you hear me? My throat is getting croaky, but can you hear me? Yeah. Good. I usually got quite a loud voice. Uh, <laughs> I'm also very good at karaoke. 
Um, I'm going to be referring to this report, Making CSR Happen. Are you familiar with the organisation, the Chartered Institute of Personnel and um, Development, CIPD? Are you familiar with that, CIPD? Do you, what do you have in, the, in Australia that's similar? I'm sorry? Australian Human Resource Institute. The Australian, Australian Human Resource Institute, Ari. Okay, and what are they doing in the, in the field of CSR and HSR and HR? HR? Nothing that I've oh. seen. Nothing yet. So that might be when we start flip charting a route that we can actually start to perhaps pursue in terms of getting on their agenda. So Okay, so that would perhaps be a good start. So, everyone's talking about Generation Y, they seem to be, <laughs> um, as the next, obviously, uh, recruitment pool. And it is discussed that uh, Generation Y are going to be looking for different values in terms of their, their workplace um, meaning. So, Motivated by deeper things than money, materialistic, success-driven, image-conscious, do not believe everything they see and hear. Well, I'm a baby boomer. I think I appears, appeals to me as well, quite frankly. But it's not just about Generation Y. And I think sometimes the debate loses itself when we concentrate purely on this, this group of people. It's also about retaining your Gen, Gen Xs and your baby boomers and training those people in this revolution. So um, I was talking to um, Kerry Baxter, who some of you might know from Swiss Ray, and she said what they, they've seen in Swiss Ray from an HR perspective, sure, the Gen Ys are coming and asking the questions, but what it's doing is opening the door for others who haven't previously felt it right to ask those questions. So it's all the generations. It's not single generation at all. This is um, from Peter Shane's book. Have you seen that one? Bright red cover. It's, very, it's a very good book, actually. It's, uh, it lays things out quite clearly. So, exactly, it's called uh, Thriving, Surviving with Gen Y at Work. Um, it's one of the better written books I think I've seen on this subject. So change, this is, this is quite a key thing, the change, isn't it? They want it, they thrive it. They feel very, com very comfortable with it indeed. And that actually, again, as if Swiss Ray are right, the Gen Y is the people that we should be using to open the doors, to enable other HR practices, to enable organisational development and change. We should be using them as vehicles in terms of this, this new way of thinking and this questioning. But also, the loyalty to the employer, that's an I thought that was quite interesting. Give me Saturday off or I'll quit. You know, m middle baby boomers like me, oh, I want to work really, really hard forever and ever. And you know, if I don't work hard, you know, my dad said if I don't work really hard and nearly have my knuckles bleeding, I will never be a good girl, you know? That's the old way of thinking. Peter Shane is American. He's American. Mm, he's an American guy. Hmm. Is it global? I, I suspect it can't be. Thinking of cultural differences in different parts of the world, I, I, the answer is I don't know. Does anyone know? I'm not actually a Gen Y expert at all on this. I, I, think, I think this is applicable to Australia. Australia, perhaps. Western, what we call Western societies. I, I, I'm not sure that you could apply this in Asian cultures, for example. Anyone got any view on that? Asian cultures are changing. Well... well a lot of it's Yeah, yeah. Don't know. I haven't actually looked at any research on Gen Y globally. Um, <coughs> I have a colleague in Alcaman and I recently did a syndicated study for the pharmaceutical industry on baby boomers and their attitudes to health. Okay. And we looked either side of that to the depression generation or the lucky generation <coughs> and then younger than that. And I think that the um, general belief is that it's relatively applicable throughout the Western world, but there, there wasn't necessarily a baby boom in Asian countries at that time. So I think we can be pretty comfortable with the stuff that we would be talking about. Yeah, yeah. The drivers in some other parts of the world for individual values and happiness are quite different, aren't they? They're quite different. So I would say let's. Yeah, I would, say, I would say, I'm guessing, as Wendy's saying, it's with the Western world type. I mean, I'm not going to spend too long on Gen Y because it's not my area of expertise, but clearly within the HR 
provision, Gen Y must be considered as one of the next pools of talent. And certainly the people I teach at Cranfield on the MBAs fall into this group. And the kind of interaction I get with them when I'm just teaching them the, the traditional CSR implementation work, the interaction is phenomenal, very questioning, very delving. And uh, as the slide said earlier on, they definitely don't just believe everything I show them or tell them. They say, why? Why, Sharon? Give me an example. I want to, I want to test that and understand it more. They're not just all seeing, all, all believing. So we accept this is one part, it's only one part of the whole HR uh, role in the CSR um, entity. So this is the report that I'm referring to. Um, it isn't free. If you want it, you'd have to buy it. I think it's about £30 or something like that. Um, but I'll be giving you the CIPD website, and you can go on and see some synopsis, synopsis of some of the case studies. You can access some other case studies. This was actually commissioned uh, just this year and was released, as I said, in October. CIPD.co.uk. 12 case studies in conjunction with our Department and Trade and Industry, CSR Academy. Now, what we do have in the UK, is, as I've been saying for the last few days, is quite a lot of collaboration now between organisations like Business in the Community, Institutes of Personnel Development, the government, NGOs and business. And my feeling is that's why we're starting to really st to make some headway here in organisational change, is because of that collaboration and that openness to share, share knowledge. And I think in Australia that's happening now, but in the last few years, as I've said before, people have taken the knowledge around CSR as um, competitive um, uh, IP, if you like, and, and they knowledge is power, but I'm seeing much more of a sharing now, and I genuinely, genuinely believe that HR getting into that role of sharing the knowledge will start to really unravel some of the barriers we're getting in the organisational development around CSR in Australia. So the DTI CSR Academy have produced a framework. This is completely free. Download this from the website. Completely free. And it will actually, it's a PDF that will actually look like that. So essentially, the report of the case studies is around how businesses are starting to actually use this framework, and this HR is absolutely the heart of this. Okay, did you get those addresses down? So this framework, which you will download for absolutely free, is based on the concept of moving from awareness to leadership. Now, there's a model. I haven't been able to show anybody yet because I haven't got a chart, but there we go. True trainers always, always refer to flip charts, don't they? <laughs> the model that I use is companies come in at this point here, awareness, an intent. They have an intent to engage in the CSR uh, sphere. They hear all about it. You can't help but hear about it, it's happening around this all the time. So they have this intent here. Very frequently, they move to this position of tactical. Who do you think what a bit of tactical CSR would be? Doing the service. Doing the service? Yeah. Compliance. I'm sorry? Compliance. Compliance. Producing a glossy report. Glossy. Yeah. PR. Going straight to the media, going straight to PR and saying they're fantastic. Actually, cause related marketing, I have to say, I was pretty tactical. Cause related marketing, I'm really strong on this, is not corporate social responsibility. It's a marketing end to me, but also a, a charity of cause also benefits. I'm very strong on that, that, that feeling. But some businesses manage to get here. And here is the clue the strategic bit. Only then, and actually Ava yesterday said about, this is what we're saying again and again, culture. It's got to be the culture of the organisation. So some of these stay around intent and awareness. They talk about it, talk about it, talk about it forever. And you can think of, I can think of organisations in this country, there's still this awareness, and they actually start talking about it quite publicly. They might do a little bit of tactical, they might have a good CRM, they might have a little bit of a glossy magazine, but the first time the organisation does something not quite right, the Sydney Morning Herald, the age, are going to go, whoa, mate, you really aren't doing this, and they're going to get, get, get pretty negative press, aren't they? Their reputation could be quite damaged by just flapping around in the tactical if they're not committed to the strategic. So, what, in fact, the DTI framework is saying exactly the same. Let's get, let's get organisations from awareness through to a leadership position. 
Uh, and I would argue you do not do this unless you engage HR absolutely the centre of every single initiative. That, that's where I come from. It's assuming that HR leads culture. It's assuming that HR leads culture? Well, okay, so they have to lead it? I think you make an assumption that HR is not all organisations, but I would say in Australia, HR is a huge influence. Okay, but they certainly have a component part of it. I accept that they're not always going to be the leading star. I accept that. Some are, some aren't. Um, but there's certainly there's got to be, because of the sheer nature of what HR does. I, I think that begs the question of what HR actually perceives its role. Oh. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. a lot of the large corporations, HR is about hiring, training, and firing, and not about organisational transformation and design. Okay. Uh, and so the HR perceive themselves differently. I've had this argument with the Institute, I'd have a long open to the outside, hoping it would stick. <laughs> well, it, it sticks to me. Well, okay, that, that is very interesting, the view of HR. I mean, has there been a movement in Australia of outsourcing HR? At all? No? Okay. Payroll. Yeah. Payroll, yeah. Oh, payroll. Oh, okay. okay. But the one thing you did say is training. So if nothing else, even at that kind of uh, operational, they say, level, HR still, within the training capacity, still actually has an opportunity to contribute to that. Maybe that's the routine. Maybe when we do our book charting, um, maybe that's one of the routes to get HR enhancements, is getting in, in, the, in the training program. I don't know. We'll do that in a minute. But essentially, what the DTI um, framework says is exactly the same. Let's move from awareness. So I'll just read this. Please do download. It's completely free. And it's... Um, it's a really good starting point for how to actually embed and integrate, because that's what we're talking about over three days. We don't want to talk first, we want to go back and do something tangible, something practical. Awareness, the broad appreciation of core CSR characteristics and how they might impinge on business decision making. Yeah. Understanding, a basic knowledge of some of the issues with the competence to apply this to specific activities. Could be tactical, applying some of the issues in some of the places. Application, the ability to supplement the basic knowledge of the issues with the competence, the competence, and HR, HR surely must be a part of um, employee competence issues, to apply to the specific activities. Integration is when we start to get to the strategic there. An in-depth understanding of the issues and the expertise in embedding CSR into the business decision-making practices. Leadership, the ability to help the managers across the organisation operate in a way that fully integrates CSR with the decision-making process. Across those uh, attainment levels, six different areas. I think they stand some. I don't need to read those out to you. I'm sure you can download and read those, those yourself. All the things we talked about, building capacity, the, the society, stakeholder, high, harnessing diversity, absolutely critical. I'm sure Tess made that absolutely clear. Absolutely critical to this whole um, embedding process. So the three companies I'm going to quickly introduce you to their case studies. So we've only got got half an hour. I do want to get the discussion going because I think that's much more important than me just speaking at you. You can read all this stuff. You can find case studies galore on the, um, on the websites. You don't need me to talk to you about it really. But the th there are 12 in there. The three I'm going to run through. EDS. Do you all know EDS here in Australia? The IT company? Yeah. Do you, most of you know? IT Solutions. B&Q was referred to yesterday so I thought I'd bring that back into the sphere. B&Q is our largest DIY chain. A bit like uh, Harvey Normans would you say? No, what's Harvey Norman? Bunnings. Bunnings. Bunnings, where? That one. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly those. Um, and then British Telecom, because we have uh, Janet here, and um, they're, they're featured here in these case studies. So their focus, as you can see, is quite different. EDS, it's about embedding the culture. EDS have had some issues around recruitment and retention, uh, well, certainly in, in Europe anyway. Uh, B&Q is purely about employment, and Tess, example, for example, mentioned yesterday, that they, oh, maybe it was the day before, because um, we've been here weeks, haven't we, now? <laughs> um, she mentioned about someone at B&Q had celebrated 90th birthday. Do you remember that? And she was saying the media coverage of that, they couldn't have paid for it, you know, it was phenomenal. So employment, very important driver. For BT, it's about the marketplace. Although I have to say that um, the CEO of, of BT, I heard him speak at the Business and the Community Conference a couple of years ago, and he, he said, BT do this because the first thing is it's the right thing to do. The second thing, our stakeholders demand it. The third thing is that it's good for business. But the first thing for BT is it's the right thing to do. Interesting. So EDS, what did they do? Let me just remember what their driver was for this. 
said it was their uh, EDS, yes, so embedding the CSR behaviours using the DTI's CSR competency framework. So essentially they championed uh, global CSR through HR. HR absolutely at the beginning of the whole process. And that was through the learning, the e-learning course. So based on that framework, a global learning, which they actually started um, across the whole man the management of the whole organisation across the globe. So the uh, e-learning objectives to understand what CSR actually means and the importance um, for the organisation. Because obviously we keep saying the whole issues around corporate responsibility are different for every single organisation. So that e-learning e tool is ensuring that the business case, the values are absolutely clear for every manager of the organisation. So the objectives are how to communicate to the stakeholders and engage the stakeholders. Recognising diversity comes up again and again and again. And how to actually apply an understanding of the key aspects into the business strategy. So again, taking it to that, that peak there of the, the triangle. Oops. The outcomes. So the European Works Council are, are supporting this initiative. And in fact, it was the European Works Council that first recommended the EDS looked at the CSR journey. Because they were actually doing a bit of tactical stuff. And they had some, some quite bad issues in terms of staff retention and recruitment. So they were doing the tactical, doing all the glossy stuff, but actually inside the organisation there were HR issues, they were losing their people, which is costing the business money. The credibility started to be raised, and so especially in recruitment terms. People are now starting to talk about working for the organisation. I'm talking about Europe here now, a European point of view. I don't know what it's like here in, in Australia. Started off with the key decision makers, start with the people at the top. We're hearing again and again, if the people at the top don't understand, you can do all the great work further down the, the HR line, do fantastic work, but you're likely to come across lots of barriers. So unless you have the broad in, uh, um, understanding of the management team, it, it could be sabotaged later on when the need, you need resource or you need some kind of support for the program. Previously, CSR initiatives were uncoordinated. They were working at the tactical which actually probably did them some more damage because they were talking about doing these great things and then there was a, um, an incongruence in the organisation. BT, their driver was marketplace. So good practice to protect and build reputation. That's why they, um, they've engaged in these, these uh, initiatives. So we know BT, 108,000 staff, which 98,000 in the UK. The fact is that the board are so closely involved in the issues and I think that you've, Janet's made that quite clear, hasn't she? The BT's director of the group corporate responsibility has support from a dedicated CSR team and reports into group corporate affairs. Operating teams, including HR, are involved with developing and reviewing the whole CSR strategy. So HR is one of the, the, the components of the, of the whole strategy. Social, ethical and environmental matters are incorporated into every, direct, every director's induction program. Every director's induction program. That is an HR matter. And into the day-to-day -day management of the business. One of BT's key performance indicators is awareness among employees of the statement of the business practice branded The Way We Work. This awareness is surveyed, uh, surveyed annually in the UK and in 2004 measured 84%. percent employees um, understood the way they work in terms of the CSR principles. And they have something called the Golden Guarantee. I don't think Janet's touched on this so far in the last few days. This is quite impressive. And this, um, sorry, I forgot to say, one of the drivers around this was, was about BT um, looking to offshore. And I think Janet touched on that yesterday, offshoring their call centres to India. That was, that was one of the initiatives, the, the, the drivers for this. So around this golden guarantee, no one would lose employment unless they wanted to. That's a very significant statement to make, isn't it, to your employees. That's a, that must be one of the key aspects of an employer of choice. HR worked with the line managers. HR were absolutely critical to this in helping to redeploy and uh, retrain where possible. There were no compulsory redundancies. Again, quite unusual, isn't it? Staff, staff views were sought to involve everybody. Now, I know that not everyone was happy still. You know, just, just because you have a golden guarantee like this does not mean every single individual across BT is going, yeah, we love all this, it's absolutely great. It doesn't happen that way. But at least they've done the due diligence and the due process 
in terms of actually engaging HR at the point of this quite significant organisation and strategic development. Other things that happened, the board director visited every site, early talks, um, one, one agreement that with the unions, I mean, the unions had to have a very significant role in, in, this, uh, in this process, um, that actually any offshore roles um, would be subject to the ETI, ethical trading initiatives and standards overseas. This is um, the other side, I mean, bearing in mind this, this report is both sides, it's not just a glowing, aren't they wonderful report, it really is warts and all. Um, do you know the organisation Sustainability in the UK? and I think here in Australia now, their comments were that this is a leadership role influencing others in the sector and Telstra at the moment are going through quite a, a traumatic time, aren't they, in many ways? I haven't heard about any golden guarantees. I'm not quite sure how HR is going to get uh, involved in, it, in Telstra's initiatives at the moment. I don't know. Um, but the, the, next, the sort of criticisms, slight criticisms, were that the um, decision to uh, start offshoring um, wasn't quite within the CSR strategy. So some of the communications may have been a bit blurred. Fair comment. And that the engagement of uh, effective stakeholders perhaps could have started earlier. Fair comment. B and Q. We've referred to the uh, Bunnings Warehouse alternative. Kingfisher Group. Um, as it says there, 330 stores, 37,000 employees. This is big. These are big HR initiatives. This, this is a significant strategy to roll out these kind of uh, issues across these number of people. Again, HR director on main board. Is that rare in Australia? HR director of main board? Yeah, it's quite rare in England, I have to say. It is quite rare. Usually you might have a, a direct report into board, but um, that, that is quite unusual. And chairs the diversity steering group as well. I mean, 12,000 to 15,000 vacancies a year, that's a lot of recruitment. It's a lot of money. Mm. Well, think, think, of the, think of what the, um, the business is. Think of the type of business. I mean, there are businesses that traditionally have very high turnover of staff, aren't there? There'll be casuals, there'll be Saturday workers, there'll be... Um, mm. Well, there's also growth there. There's also significant growth. I'm not quite sure how many stores they, they open on a regular basis, but there's also the growth factor as well. Before they actually recruit for a new store, they look at the demographic information. Actually, all organisations should do that, shouldn't they, really? Where is our store going to be and uh, who are we selling to, who are we recruiting? The individuals can also apply directly. The whole recruitment process has been designed to eliminate any discrimination at any, any uh, point of the process. I know Kate, um, Tess uses B&Q. Did she talk to you about these guys earlier on? Okay, I know she does use them as a case study, as good, good employment and uh, good diversity practice. There is an HR advisor in every single store, and every line manager is trained in diversity. That's also a very significant HR um, initiative. Outcomes? Of course. <laughs> improved recruitment and retention. Whilst, you, you might, yeah, still probably quite a high turnover, it's still improved and saved the company money. Positive profile, media coverage being and get is just amazing. Did you, um, <laughs> digress, did you see the, um, oh gosh, uh, Helen McCarthy doing the Around the World Challenge <laughs> for, uh, last year? No? She um, sailed around, she was the, um, I think she's the most recent woman to sail around the world single-handed, and the boat was sponsored by B&Q, and it was this wonderful B&Q um, sail. Every time we turned on the television, B&Q, bright orange. And I saw one of those funny emails that came across, and it said, B&Q, how can you get a boat around the world in um, however many days, um, but you can't get my kitchen to me, which I ordered 35 days ago and have paid for? <laughs> That's one fun, very funny. <laughs> Um, I guess it's one of the spoof emails, but hit the, hit the spot. Because, of course, that is cause related marketing, really. And um, new product development. So, with a diverse, and again, Tess has touched, touched on this before, with a diverse um, people of workers, really touching them with your customer base and understanding your customer base. Different people are going to have different desires and needs for their DIY, aren't they? So, they've actually enhanced product development as well. Marks and Spencers, we've talked about a few times. Marks and Spencers have had, had all sorts of um, uh, business issues over the last few years, but their CSR is still very strong and very good. 
absolutely fine. It's kept intact. And Ed Williams, who was at the time um, head of CSR, worked absolutely hand in hand with Gene Tomlin's head of HR. 58,000 people. The two worked together. All their policies, all their programs, absolutely they worked together. And 50% of the management bonus linked to delivering the targets. That is integrating CSR at the heart of HR. Absolutely great case study. Again, you, if you go onto the website, you can find lots of information about MS. If you go to their website, you'll see how they, they do that. BHP Billiton, I work with here in Australia, 40% of their balance scorecard, KPI related, um, to their, their health and safety, environmental, and community um, standards. These are seriously embedded programs. And I mentioned before that BHP train people at induction, second year graduate, third year graduate. They keep the consistent training. They don't do it once, they do it again and again and again. And the programs that we run with them, whilst they're also about performance, they're also about strategy, the common thread is their CSR and sustainability. It actually touches every single. I'm sorry. Um, I could offhand. Oh yeah, well, I can't hear the ladies. It's, it's been a couple of minutes, so I'll oh. be around the microphone. Uh, sorry. You have to shout because I can't hear you. Yeah. Um, uh, they're they're very, they're they're listed. You can uh, look at them on the website. In fact, yeah, they're very clearly listed. And in fact, every year, what Marks and Spencers do is they um, they specify what their target is going to be. They tell you how they performed the previous year, how they're going to do it. It's very transparent, very open. So you can see, there's been three different principles that they have around the community, environment, the workplace, respectively. Yeah. Okay, so before we start having some discussion, because I do want 20 minutes or so to, to get the discussion going and um, talk about how we can get HR really involved in this movement in Australia. Common drivers, this, the report says this, we know this already, we didn't need a report to be told this, but um, anyway, we can keep, keep repeating information. Most common drivers, reputation management, wish to reinforce and embed behaviours, seems to be the more driving. In fact, I would say that the reputation and PR is starting to falter under the wish to reinforce and embed. I'm seeing quite a movement, in, in, in a shift in that. External pressures we talked about and, and branding for staff recruitment and retention. In the report there from the Chartered Institute of Personal and Development, uh, most commonly reported benefits, of course, recruitment and retention. It has an absolute bottom line dollar value, doesn't it? And I'd love to see some research come out of some of the um, HR institutions around that to actually what the value is around those, um, that, that retention rate. Improved staff commitment and advocacy, bound to have a value to the, to the business, and great awareness of risks and opportunities. I don't need to read that to you. I'd like to get on to some discussions, I think. Be more useful. So another model I'm... Oh, I can't... I'm nice to be moved out of chronological order. Um, another model I'm looking at is the Chartered Institute of Personal Development. Yeah. 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 Y
So, for example, um, I know uh, I have a friend in England who was a senior HR manager of ICI chemicals company and uh, this is a couple of years ago now and she was saying Sharon what is happening people used to want to be working with the ICI and they wanted to have ICI on their CV it was a good place to start as, as a graduate good place to start your career and she said we're interviewing people first interview goes through okay second interview maybe okay perhaps a weekend assessment program and then at the time of choosing some of these graduates, many of these graduates are saying, actually, I've looked into the organisation. I don't quite like what you're doing in this far-flung place on the other side of the world. I don't want to work for you. My value set doesn't, isn't congruent with this organisation. And that's ICI. Would have been a creme de la creme place to start on your CV. And I'm hearing that in banking. Banks are saying that the employees are actually um, interviewing them, etc. So that's the shift in this, this whole, whole field.